Hello everyone. Today the bookworms are going to be reading Freak the Mighty by Rodman Philbrick, Part 1. Chapter 1, The Unvanquished Truth. I never had a brain until Freak came along and let me borrow his for a while. And that's the truth, the whole truth, the unvanquished truth, is how Freak would say it. And for a long time it was him who did the talking. Except, I had a way of saying things with my fists and my feet, even before we became Freak the Mighty, slaying dragons and fools and walking high above in the world. Called me Kicker for a time. This was daycare, the year Graham and Grimm took me over, and I had to think about booting anyone who dared to touch me, because they were always trying to throw a hug on me, like it was medicine I needed. Graham and Grimm blessed their pointed little heads, they're my mother's people, her parents, and they figured, whoa, better put this little critter with other little critters his own age, maybe it will improve his temper. Yeah, right, instead what happened? I invented games like kickboxing, and kick knees, and kick faces, and kick teachers, and kick the other little decay critters, because I knew what a rotten lie that hug stuff was. Oh, I knew. That's when I got my first look at Freak, that year of the phony hugs. He didn't look so different back then. We were all of us pretty small, right? But he wasn't in the playroom with us every day. Just now and then he'd show up. Looking sort of fierce is how I remember him, except later it was Freak himself who taught me that remembering is a great invention of the mind, and if you try hard enough, you can remember anything, whether it really happened or not. So maybe he wasn't really all that fierce in daycare, Except I'm pretty sure he did hit a kid with his crutch once, whacked a little brat pretty good, and for some reason, Little Kicker never got around to kicking Little Freak. Maybe it was those crutches kept me from lashing out at him. Man, those crutches were cool. I wanted a pair for myself. And when Little Freak showed up one day with these shiny braces strapped to his crooked legs, metal tubes right up to his hips, why those were even more cool than crutches. I'm Robot Man! Little Freak would go, making these weird robot noises as he humped himself around the playground. Rrr, 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 like he had robot motors inside his legs, going rrr, rrr, rrr. And this look like, don't mess with me, man. Maybe I got a laser cannon hidden inside these leg braces. Smoke a hole right through you. No question, Freak was hooked on robots even back then. This little guy, two feet tall, and already he knew what he wanted. Then for a long time, I never saw Freak anymore. One day he just never came back to daycare. And the next thing I remember, I'm like in third grade or something, and I catch a glimpse of this yellow-haired kid scowling at me from one of those cripple vans. Man, they were death ray eyes. And I think, hey, that's him, the robot boy. And it was like, whoa, because I'd forgotten all about him. Daycare was a blank place in my head, and nobody had called me kicker for a long time. Mad Max they were calling me, or Max Factor, or this one butthead in LD class called me Maxipad, until I persuaded him otherwise. Graham and Grimm had always called me Maxwell though, which is supposed to be my real name, and sometimes I hate it that worst of all. Maxwell. Ugh. Grimm out in the kitchen one night after supper, whispering to Graham had she noticed how much Maxwell was getting to look like him which is the way he always talked about my father, who had married his dear departed daughter and produced Eek Eek Maxwell. Grimm never says my father's name, just him, like his name is too scary to say. It's more than just the way Maxwell resembles him. Grimm says that night in the kitchen, The boy is like him. We'd better watch out. You never know what he might do to us while we're sleeping, like his father did. And Graham right away shushes him and says, don't ever say that, because little pictures have big ears, which makes me run to the mirror to see if it is my big ears made me look like him. What a butthead, huh? Well, I was a butthead, because like I said, I never had a brain until Freak moved down the street. The summer before 8th grade, right? That's the summer I grew so fast that Grimm said, We'd best let the boy go barefoot, he's exploding out of his shoes. That barefoot summer, when I fell down a lot and the weirdo robot boy with his white yellow hair and his weird fierce eyes moved into the duplex down on the block with his beautiful brown-haired mom, the fair Gwen of Air. Chapter 2 Up from the Down Under That summer, let's see, I'm still living in the basement, my own private down under, in the little room Grim built for me there, glued up this cheap paneling, right? It sort of buckles away from the concrete cellar walls, 
a regular ripple effect, but do I complain about the crummy paneling or the rug that smells like low tide? I do not, because I like it in the down under, got the place all to myself in no fear of Gramps sticking her head in the door and saying, Maxwell, dear, what are you doing? Not that I ever do much of anything. Grim has it fixed in his head. I'm at a dangerous age and they need to keep me under observation, like I might make bombs or start a fire or whack out the local pets with my trusty slingshot or whatever. Except I never had a slingshot. It was Grim who had one when he was my age. The proof is right there in the family photo album. You can see this blurry little miniature Grim with no front teeth grinning at the camera and yanking back on this prehistoric slingshot. Good for whacking mastodons, probably. Just proper targets, Grim says, closing up the photo album. End of discussion. Like, oops, better hide the evidence. Don't want to give the dangerous boy any ideas. Not that I have any ideas. My brain is vacant, okay? I'm just this critter hiding out in the basement drooling in my comic books or whatever. All right, I never actually drool, but you get the picture. Anyhow, this is the first day of July, already counting down for the 4th and wondering where can I get an M80, which is supposed to have the explosive power of a quarter stick of dynamite or something, and when it goes off, your heart thuds to stop for a microsecond wham, which is probably what Grimm is afraid of. Eek eek, Maxwell armed with dynamite. So finally, I get bored in the down under and I'm hanging out in the so-called backyard, your basic chunk of chain link heaven. Graham keeps this crummy little mower in the shed, but what's the point of mowing dirt, right? Okay, I'm out there messing around, and that's when I see the moving van. Not your mainstream, nationwide, brand name mover, either. Just some cheap local outfit. These big bearded dudes in their sweaty undershirts lugging stuff into the duplex half that's been vacant since last Christmas, when the dope fiend who lived there finally got busted. At first, I'm thinking the dope fiend is back. He's out of jail or whatever, and he's moving his stuff back in. Then I see the fair Gwen. Not that I knew her name. That was a little while later. At first, she's a glimpse. Got her going between the van and the front door, talking to the beards. I'm thinking, hey, I know her. And then I'm thinking, no way, butthead. No way you'd know a female that beautiful. Because she looks like some kind of movie star, wearing those old jeans and a baggy t-shirt, and her long hair is tied back and she's probably sweating, but she still looks like a movie star, like she has this glow, a secret spotlight that follows her around and makes her eyes light up. And I'm thinking, well this improves the old neighborhood. You're thinking, yeah right, the goon is barely out of 7th grade, who does he think he is? All I'm saying, the fair Gwen had star quality, and even a total moron can see it. And the reason she looked familiar is, I must have seen her bringing Freak to daycare, way back in the dark ages, because the next thing I notice is this crippled up yellow-haired midget kid strutting around the sidewalk, giving orders to the beards. He's going, hey you doofus, yeah you with that hairy face, take it easy with that box, that box contains a computer, you know what a computer is? I can't believe it. By then, I'm sneaking along the street to see what's going on. And there's this weird-looking little dude. He's got a normal-sized head, but the rest of him is shorter than a yardstick and kind of twisted in a way that means he can't stand up straight and makes his chest puff out, and he's waving his crutches around and yelling at the movers. Hey, Gwen, one of the beards says. Can't you give this kid a pill or something? He's driving us nuts. So Gwen comes out of the house and pushes the hair out of her big brown eyes and she goes, Kevin, go play in the backyard, okay? But my computer! Your computer is fine. Leave the men alone. They'll be done soon and then we can have lunch. By, th by this time, I'm hunkering along in front of the place, trying to maintain a casual attitude. Except, like I said, my feet are going wild that year and I keep tripping over everything. Cracks in the sidewalk, ants on the sidewalk, shadows, anything. Then the strange little dude jerks himself around and he catches sight of me and he lifts a crutch and points it up at my heart and he goes, Identify yourself, earthling. I'm busy keeping my feet from tripping and don't get it that he means me. I said identify yourself, earthling, or suffer the consequences. And I'm like, what? But before I can decide whether or not to tell him my name or which name, because by now I recognize him as the weird little robot kid from daycare and maybe he remembers me as kicker, Anyhow, before I can say a word, he pulls the trigger on that crutch and makes a weapon noise, and he goes, Then die, Earthling, die! I motor out of theirs without saying a word, because I'm pretty sure he really means it. The way he points that crutch is only part of it. 
You have to see the look in his eye. Man, that little dude really hates me. He wants me to die. Chapter three, American Flyer. Okay, back to the down under, right? My room in the basement. Scuttle into your dim hole in the ground, Maxwell dear. Big goon like you growing up out an inch a day, and this midget kid, this crippled little humanoid, he actually scared you. Not the kind of scare that makes your knee bone feel like water. More the kind of scare where you go, whoa! I don't understand this. I don't get it. What's going on? Like calling me Earthling, which by itself is pretty weird, right? I already mentioned a few of the names I've been called, but until the robot boy showed up, nobody had ever called me Earthling. And so I'm lying on my mattress there in the great down under, and it comes to me that he's right. I am an Earthling. We are all of us Earthlings, but we don't call each other Earthling. No need, because it's the same thing that in this country we are all Americans, but we don't go around to people and say, "Excuse me, American, can you tell me how to get to the nearest Seven Eleven?" So I'm thinking about that for a while, lying there in the cellar dark, and pretty soon the down under starts to get small. Like the walls are shrinking, and I go up the bulkhead stairs into the backyard and find a place where I can check it out. There's this one scraggly tree behind the little freak's house, right? Like a stick in the ground with a few wimped-out branches, and there he is, hardly any bigger now than he was in a daycare, and he's standing there waving his crutch up at the tree. I kind of slide over to the chain-link fence, getting a better angle on the scene. What's he doing, whacking at that crummy tree? Trying to jump up and hit this branch with this little crutch, and he's mad, hopping mad. Only he can't really jump. He just makes this jumping kind of motion. His feet never leave the ground. Then what he does? He throws down the crutch and he gets down on his hands and knees and crawls back to his house. If you didn't know, you would think he was like a kindergarten creeper who forgot how to walk. He's that small, and he crawls real good, better than he can walk. Before you know it, he's dragging this wagon out from under the steps. Rusty red thing, one of those old American flyer models. Anyhow, the little freak is tugging it backwards, a few inches at a time, chugging along until he gets that little wagon under the tree. Next thing, he picks up his crutch and he climbs in the wagon and he stands up and he's whacking at the tree again. By now, I figured out that there's something stuck up in the branches and he wants to get it down. This small, bright-colored thing looks like a piece of folded paper. Whatever it is, that paper thing, he wants it real bad. But even with the wagon, there's no way he can reach it. No way. So I go over there to his backyard, trying to be really quiet. But I'm no good at sneaking up. Not with these humongous feet. And he turns and faces me with crutch raised up, like he's ready to hit a grand slam on my head. He wants, he wants to say something. You can tell that much. But he's so mad. He's all huffed up, and that noise he makes. It could be from a dog or something, and he sounds like he can hardly breathe. What I do, I keep out of range of that crutch and just reach up and pick the paper thing right out of the tree. Except it's not a paper thing; it's a plastic bird, light as a feather. I have to hold it real careful, or it might break. That's how flimsy it is. I go, "You want this back or what?" The little freak is staring at me, bug-eyed, and he goes, "Oh, it talks." I give him the bird thing. What is it like a model airplane or something? You can tell he's real happy to have the bird thing back, and his face isn't quite so fierce. He sits down in the wagon and he goes, "This is an ornithopter. An ornithopter is defined as an experimental device propelled by flapping wings, or you could say that an ornithopter is just a big word for mechanical bird. That's how he talked, like right out of a dictionary. So smart you can hardly believe it. While he's talking, he's winding up the bird thing." There's this elastic band inside, and he goes, "Observe and be amazed, Earthling," and then he lets it go. And you know what? I am amazed because it does fly just like a little bird, flitting up and down and around, higher than I can reach. I chase after the thing until it points against the scrawny tree trunk, and I bring it back to him, and he winds it up again and makes it fly. We keep doing that. It must be for almost an hour until finally the elastic breaks. I figure that it's end of ornithopter, but he says something like, "All mechanical objects require periodic maintenance. We'll schedule installation of a new propulsion unit as soon as the fair gwen of air gets a replacement." Even though I'm not sure what he means, I go, "That's cool. You live around here, Earthling." Over there, I point out the house in the down under. He goes, 
What? And I figure it's easier to show him than explain all about Graham and Graham and the room in the cellar. So I pick up the handle to the American flyer wagon and I tow him over. It's real easy. He doesn't weigh much, and I'm pretty sure I remember looking back and seeing him sitting up in the wagon as happy as can be, like he's really enjoying the ride and not embarrassed to have me pulling him around. But like Freak says later in this book, you can remember anything, whether it happened or not. All I'm really sure of is he never hit me with that crutch. That's it for today, everyone. I hope you guys enjoyed. For more read-alongs like these, don't forget to subscribe. If you enjoyed the book, give it a big thumbs up and share it with a friend. Don't forget to join us tomorrow for the next part of this book. I'll see you guys next time. Bye!